Okay. Thank you so very much. Now, I'm going to segue to plaintiff's motion limiting number seven because I think that's the better time before I get to your motion for summary judgment because the court's already made a ruling with regards to those videos in the last motion. And so I think this is now narrowed the motion limiting number seven to the Wizard of Oz. I'm giving you a court's inclination on the Wizard of Oz. Enjoy the book, not the movie. I went back to the office, and at first I was embarrassed, uh, but then I thought to myself, I'm not an entertainment lawyer, so why would I know something like that? So when we did the research, we found out that the court's inclination was correct. That Sometimes I am. The copyright had expired, but apparently Warner Brothers went in there, they bought the rights, and they extended it somehow for another 35 years. Uh, but we did do the research. Yeah, there's actually specific legislation, Supreme Court case, and then subsequent Federal Circuit cases. Yeah. Right. Well, anyway, uh, Warner Brothers seems to have a better leg to stand on than I would have thought yesterday. Um, so, uh, but then we did the other research that said that if you use it during a public proceeding, like a trial, so, but at, I've offered it as an accommodation, we'll go back to the book, and I can take the same type of pictures from the book, and I'll just rework it with the book pictures. Realistically, the book's in public domain. The movie is not. Your fair use argument, while I'm appreciative of it, and I'm not really going to start a huge segue, if those cases are specific, generally, to the issue at hand for the fair use. They're not utilizing it as an example in an unrelated type case. I don't think anybody wants to go there. I think since you have offered the alternative that you'd like to use the book I, I, sketches that are in the public domain, I'm going to give each of the other parties an opportunity to take a look at that, so if they have a issue about it, that the court can address it. But yeah. I don't see that as a preclusion. Is that so, going to meet your needs? Yes, we won't use a video. We'll just take the book sketches, and I think the books book. I've gone through the book sketches real quick, and I think there's enough there that we can, without having our own artists jump in, we might have to have our own artists jump in for one of the three slides. But uh, but okay. we will do either the book or a visual. But I'll show. I'll show it to opposing counsel. Okay. Okay. So opposing counsel, you have an opportunity. If it's an issue, let me know. Okay. Um, otherwise, the court's net. Okay. The court's analysis for the concept. Okay. And yes, I've seen this. I've seen the book sketches. And I, in general, conceptually, my analysis is it's appropriate for the circumstances. However, in the absence of actually see, having the parties have an opportunity to see the actual sketches that are being proposed. The appropriate thing is to allow you each an opportunity to view it, and if somebody's raising an objection to those particular sketches, not the concept, because the concept the court's going to find appropriate, then you need to let the court know we need to get that taken care of as soon as possible, and hopefully, we can't, is there any reason we can't add that to the 27th? Get that oh, taken well, care? Easily, Your Honor. Does that work for opposing counsels? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And once again, if it doesn't, let me know. I mean, I'm just trying to get you all as much as you can get taken care of so that for your trial purposes, but if it's too much or too little, let the court know. Okay, so does anybody, that was a court's inclination, okay, that colloquy was an inclination. Does either real water, first, do you wish to be further heard on what was put, the deferred portion of plaintiff's motion limiting number seven, i.e. the admission of the videos for the substantive purpose separate from the sanction purpose and the Wizard of Oz alternative now, the sketch from the book, not the video? For real water, nothing further. Council for Terrible Herbs. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Council for Plaintiff, do you want the last word? No? Okay. So then the court turns that inclination into an order, and then we'll. I'm going to leave it to you all to bring it up for the 27th, right? We're not going to add another item because there's really nothing, quote, being deferred by the court, okay? So that takes care of your motion limiting number seven. That one's checked off. So now I think you want to go to the motion for summary judgment. Is that correct? Oh, Judge, Judge, we still had the, uh, the, I know the promotional videos uh, were, were admitted under the previous ruling, but there is a motion outstanding that still had that attached to it. We filed a motion to pre-admit the promotional videos, <laughs> still videos in the court granted the second two. Okay, votes. right. So, oh, so you want the, uh, sorry, you're correct. You're talking about the pre-admission pre component right. versus just the right. preclusion yeah. component. Okay. We do, we do want to play them during the opening. Let me give you a few moments and let me hear everybody else's response on that. Just so it's fresh in everybody's mind where today's viewpoint is. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Your Honor, we think that uh, uh, the, the you know the, as I've indicated before, the advertising is very important to us because we think it explains the underlying concept of uh, products liability to the jury, and I, I'm sure they'll follow the court's instructions. But they see the reason for following the court's instructions. We think it's better for us. So at the very beginning of the case, we're going to try to develop a theme that real water was marketed extensively by terrible herbs. We want to show those videos because it dovetails into the business plan, the statement of the business plan. So that's the reason we request their pre-admission room. Okay, Councilor Rillwater, do you wish to be heard? Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. Councilor Chapel Hurst, do you wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. While we understand the court's um, order allowing the videos, we would object to their pre-admission until somebody's established some foundation and some context. I think context is going to be important and for them to just get up and argue about these videos and conclude from the showing of those videos that Terrible Herbs was the marketing arm for uh, real water for years. I think that's unduly prejudicial. It sounds like argument uh, to me and we would object to the pre-admission. But I understood counsel for plaintiff and I'm going to I guess I'll, let me let you finish because I'm understanding you're saying opening statement with a good faith belief that you're going to establish. You're not going to argue that they were the marketing arm. You're going to. We're going to show. We're going to show the business plan. And the business plan basically says the Terrible Hurts was the marketing arm for Real Water itself. Not exactly in those words, but that is the clear gist of the business plan. And then we're going to say, "Here are the videos. We'll play the videos." So that that is the. Okay. So we're you know that's we okay. think it's pretty important evidence of the case. Here's the court's ruling. The court's ruling is the court's going to grant the pre-admission with the context that it has to be proper under opening statement guidelines. The court's in no way expanding or contracting standard opening statement guidelines. The court finds it one of the reasons for pre-admission that would be appropriate in addition, separate and apart from the substantive analysis that was in the supplemental brief and everyone had a full opportunity to brief. Independently of that is the sanction component. The sanction component was that they are admitted. So the issues about potential prejudice really had were addressed in this court's determination of the appropriate sanction in light of the issues with regards to the last motion. And as long as it's not done by argument, it's done in proper opening statement, then the court is going to allow the pre-admission. And if there's an objection how it's presented at the time of opening statement, obviously parties have a right to reserve the right to the process versus the actual videos being Admitted. It is so ordered. Okay. Now, so we're going to. There was summary judgment next, or are we doing the step to admit liability next? Um, I did have one motion. I think it's moved now. The motion to leave to file the attached addendum. I think. Sorry, but we'll, in effect, oh. it's been ruled. Um, yeah, either one. That's what you're saying. The addendum, which you're talking about, is the motion eliminating number seven, the additional supplemental brief That's that correct. the court considered and gave them yes. an opportunity to respond to. Yes. I granted that OST. So, is anyone contending that that's outstanding for the court for the allowing of the supplemental brief? Because I gave everybody supplementals to that supplemental. And rule water has no objection there. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm not following. Sir, procedurally, what I understand Mr. Kemp is saying, procedurally is to the extent they, under the rules, they have to request of the court to be able to file a supplemental briefing. They technically filed it as a motion to request the supplemental briefing. The court, for the court's position, I thought I had addressed this in open court with each of you all, gave everybody else the opportunity to, refine, to reply to said supplemental briefing, which meant I was letting in I was granting the request for supplemental briefing because I then gave everyone an opportunity to respond to it and we continued it to today's date. But to the extent that the court did not say the magic words, granted it is so ordered, I think Mr. Kemp is properly asking the court, had I ruled on that already? Yeah, I understood, Your Honor, to have granted it. And that's okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, so you're taking care of there. Thank you for those points of clarification. So. Let me go back. I have to give a couple of document numbers because we've been talking about documents that we all know about, but let me be clear. So the court already addressed this morning. It was document 536, the motion to strike with the opposition 766 and 962. Thereafter, the court then went back and addressed document 685, plaintiff's motion eliminating number seven to pre-admit 
the real water marketing videos, the ET&T's opposition, terrible herbs, ET&T's opposition there too, 852. The real water joinder to the opposition, 891, 959 was the reply. And then we also addressed document 992, which just the last one a moment ago, which Mr. Kemp just raised, was the motion for leave to file the attached addendum to the reply to the opposition. And then the notice of entry of order was 993. And then we had document 1005 that was filed by Terrible Herbs, which was their supplemental opposition and no future, no additional document by real water on that. So those are all taken care of as well. Okay, so did I clear that up? Everyone good on those? Okay, thank you. Sorry, try not to do my team with, you know, without going document by document. So, um, so we doing next the motion for summary judgment. Are we doing uh, terrible herbs motion limiting number one to exclude evidence in reference to the stipped admission of liability? Whichever you want to do, Your Honor. Prepared. I think it makes sense to do the motion for summary judgment first. Yeah. Okay, but that's the request. Then we'll go there. Okay, so we're doing document 533, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment number one, as to one, plaintiff's claim for strict product liability against real water and terrible herbs, and two, that real water and terrible herbs sold an adulterated product in opposition thereto by terrible herbs, 777, real water's opposition thereto, 791, plaintiff's reply, 969. Um, Terrell Herb Supplemental Opposition, Document 998, Plaintiff Supplement, Document 999, and Real Water. I don't think I, I don't recall. Not file okay, perfect. Then we got that taken care of. This is why I said we were at about 1,000 plus. Okay. So remember, the courts already heard some of the oral argument that you all addressed last week, and then we had the supplement because of the intervening stip that came about and some of the other issues. So, Mr. Peppermint, I'm sure you're going to... Clear up the puzzle pieces and set forth your picture you want to paint. Go ahead, please. Uh, I think, as Mr. Parker said, there is not much left to argue here. I just would like to address the STIP situation, which the court requested supplemental briefing on. Uh, I do think this issue is well briefed, and I think it's well briefed because I believe that the court saw this issue clearer than anybody here. I don't know if the court recalls, but last week during... I have a memory of what I said last week. Maybe you asked me five, ten years ago, but go ahead, please. During uh, uh, oral argument by Terrible Herps on, on a motion, I don't remember which one, but Terrible Herps' argument was, well, Your Honor, there's no evidence that there was hydrazine in the real water sold by Terrible Herps. And Your Honor made the comment, well, counsel, isn't... Real water stipulation evidence that real that hydrazine was in the real water sold by Terrible Herbs, and I think that struck at the heart of this. Your Honor was absolutely right. It was a very apt and astute observation, and that's what this stip is. It's it's evidence. It's conclusive evidence when the manufacturer says the water that we made and provided to you, Terrible Herbs, to sell was defective and unreasonably dangerous due to hydrazine contamination, that is a done issue. There's no question of fact for trial on that. It's, there's no evidence regardless, but even assuming if there were, that is conclusive proof of that element of defect. And uh, to circle it back on summary judgment, in terms of causation, we've outlined all the evidence. We have uh, the medical expert saying to a reasonable degree of medical probability that hydrazine in the retail real water was a substantial factor in Miles Hunt Wardson's liver injury. That evidence is unrebutted. Terrible Herbs has no expert. They have no competent medical uh, opinion that it wasn't real water, uh, that it wasn't hydrazine in the Terrible Herbs water that was a substantial factor. They have no alternative causation theory. They have the, the quintessential case built on gossamer threads of whimsy, speculation, and conjecture, Your Honor. And so we would ask for uh, the, all the reasons stated in the, the thorough briefing that our summary judgment be granted. Okay. Counsel, I have one quick question before Mr. Ojib gets up. Um, sure. As if you recall during last week's argument, right, by other counsel, it was the adulterated component. So are you contending that that is also in the stip? Because I heard Real Water last week say, no, it's not. So are you saying that's still uncontested? Um, Your Honor, I think that issue is, is largely moot. 
with respect to real water's concern. Uh, if we think summary judgment on uh, Miles Hunt Wartson's entire strict liability claim against terrible herps is appropriate, uh, if the court were to somehow find a question of fact on, on causation, which I don't believe there is any, uh, we would ask that still the adulterated product uh, product defect element of that claim be established on summary judgment. Okay. But it's only related to the water sold by Terrible Herbs because uh, real water conceded with respect to the other individual plaintiffs. And there's no need to argue that all water was adulterated, which I think that was their concern. So your motion is liability as to terrible herbs for Hunsworthson, is that correct? Liability Co and causation, yes, Your Honor, with damages to be determined in trial. Okay. Thank you so very much, you. Council for Real Water. In, in light of where we are today, go ahead, whatever today's Viewpoint is. Thank you, Your Honor. Joel Liu on behalf of Real Water. That was exactly the question I had, too. Um, as part of the stipulation in, uh, in paragraph four of the stipulation, plaintiffs are dismissing their negligence and negligence per se claim. The negligence per se claim in this case is the third cause of action, adulterated product against Real Water. So the motion for summary judgment is adulteration is moot as to Real Water because that has been dismissed. We did make arguments as to why the water is not adulterated. I could certainly argue those, but I think it's all moot. I think as far as the causation as to Miles Hunwardson, that's not disputed. There was causation disputed as to Mary and Brody, but uh, again, I, I don't think that's at issue any longer. Okay, you can appreciate, I just, clarity, because your co-counsel right last week said adulterated was still at issue. so. Is it real water's position where we are today? It is clear that since it's from your view, it's completely dismissed and so it's moot. Or I just yes, want to make sir. sure I'm taking everybody's okay. Taking the last thing that Mr. Peppermint said, I believe it is moot. I'm happy to address it if it's not. Well, let me find out from Mr. Peppermint. Mr. Peppermint, are you still pursuing your third cause of action against real water? For no, uh, no, Your Honor, our negligence based claims have been dismissed. Okay, so is the word adulterated water, is adulterated, is that even still part of your motion for summary judgment as to real water? Uh, no, Your Honor, I believe that the requests for summary judgment as to real water are moot. They've admitted they sold defective water to each of the individual plaintiffs. Counsel for real water, do you concur? Nothing further to add. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you Based on the agreement of... Real water and plaintiffs. Cheryl Herbst, you're still left, so go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, essentially, what the plaintiffs and real water have agreed to do is impose their liability on terrible herbs by entering to a stipulation that essentially admits liability and causation for terrible herbs, or at least is an effort to do so. Um, I've looked for a case that is similar to this anywhere, and I cannot find one. And a case being where a product manufacturer stipulates to liability and causation for all retailers, which is essentially what happens here when real water is claiming or admits to liability and causation, not just for the five-gallon jugs, but for retail bottles. Terrible Herbs is not a party to the stipulation. It cannot be bound by the stipulation, but that's essentially what the plaintiffs are trying to do. I mean, the, the closest thing we can analogize this to is a request for admission. And those requests can only apply to the party making the admission. Here, Terrible Herbs has not made an admission. This is not like a case where all product manufactured by a particular manufacturer was defective. This is a situation where we have evidence of the lack of causation and the lack of hydrazine in certain bottles predating 2020. And what the plaintiffs are essentially trying to do is deprive 
terrible herbs of a fair trial and its right to defend itself by entering into this stipulation with real water. That should not be permitted. It's not fair to have one party admit liability and causation on behalf of another. Although we're not a signatory to that uh, stipulation, that's the effect of what the plaintiffs are arguing here. Their motion for summary or their supplemental briefing essentially points back to the stipulation and says that's conclusive evidence and we have no opportunity to defend ourselves. But how can that be if we didn't enter into the stipulation? I stop and ask sure. a couple questions. This court sees as two separate issues, right? Which is why I said for supplemental two separate. One is terrible herbs legally bound by this stipulation, meaning it was conclusive for terrible herbs, right? That was the first part. The second is, even if the answer to that question is no, right? Is did terrible herbs in response to the substantive aspects of the motion for summary judgment and they defeat a motion for summary judgment, right? Just as if the whole stipulation didn't exist and this was just a terrible herbs, right? All right. So I understand your first part of the argument is you're saying you're not legally bound. So then are you going to address the substantive portion of how terrible herbs is saying that it is raise material issues of fact or how plaintiff hasn't met their burden right going to a normal rule 56 standard well, right I thought we already addressed that during the first argument and the two issues we were addressing today was sure are well, we I, bound and what is the impact so I think I've addressed those but during the first argument we certainly presented evidence there's a at a minimum a tribal issue of material fact on causation there's circumstantial evidence on both sides and no direct evidence on either side as to the hydrazine being in the real water do you remember I'm not in any way saying Mr. Odu does not speak for terrible herbs. I fully understand that. But you, no. would you, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this particular question. There were statements made to the court when the court asked a question last week, right, of counsel for real water. And you may recall his response, how he walked through from his viewpoint what terrible herbs may or may not have for purposes of their evidence. So I'm not saying I'm adopting that, right? But that's the reason why I'm going to ask you the question is why I'm asking the question here today. Because remember from last week's argument, I'm fully appreciative. Remember, this is the very first one that the court addressed and done a whole bunch of motions since then. So with the eyes for today, right, and where we are today, do you want a moment or two? Because I'm going to give it to you if you do, and then I'm going to let, obviously, other counsels respond, right? Is to say what evidence or how terrible herbs from your position has substantively addressed the motion for summary judgment for issues going to trial based on all the rulings that have happened between when this motion first came up to today, right, with where we're looking at it with a today's vision. And I'm not saying it does or does not change anything. I'm just giving you a chance if you want it to do a few minutes of that. And then Mr. Pepperman will have last word on his motion. Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence that we've been addressing is, well, first of all, as we've repeated, there's a lack of direct evidence showing hydrazine in real water bottles sold by Terrible Herbs in 2019 or prior, or, or at any time, actually. There is testing of retail bottles from later in 2020 and 2021, but those retail bottles were not from Terrible Herbs distributor or from Terrible Herbs. So those don't really negate or prove that there was hydrazine in the bottles in 2019. So can you walk me through witnesses, right? Is it an expert? Is it, a, it wouldn't be a lay person, right? Because there's no direct. So is it an expert? Is it a document? What have you shown in the multitude of pleadings before the court now on this particular motion that under Rule 56 would address plaintiff's motion? Well, we did use the urofins testing to show that even that testing from 20 to 21 bottles didn't show reportable levels of hydrazine in all seven bottles, just in five with some detectable levels in six 
and below reporting limits in seven. We submitted the testimony of Mr. Hunwardson himself, who testified that he consumed retail bottles of real water from 2016, 2017 through mid 2018 with no problems. He testified, and his mother testified that when they moved in mid 2018 to a new home, they saw a real water truck and began getting home delivery because he was spending so much money on retail bottles. It was around that same time that he believes he began experiencing symptoms which he now attributes to real water. And that would be the alternative causation. We do have an alternative causation. There is evidence that the five-gallon jugs did have hydrazine in them in 2020, 2021, and now with Mr. Hunwardson's testimony, seems to indicate that there was also hydrazine in his five-gallon jugs. He was consuming from five-gallon jugs at copious amounts, much more than the retail bottles. We submitted evidence of the whole 2020 and 2021 investigation showing that there was no retail bottles by the government agencies uh, found to have caused any problems anywhere in the country and that the outbreak was isolated to here in Clark County, likely because it was associated with the five gallon jugs. We submitted testimony from Blaine Jones and Casey Aiken that indicated that regardless of the location, the five gallon jugs were always on a separate manufacturing line than the retail bottles. I have the concentrate issue. The concentrate issue is we submitted evidence from the plaintiff's own experts saying there is not evidence of bad concentrate, what he, he described as some concentrate was good, some concentrate was bad, was bad, and that's why we see no evidence of outbreaks or um, clusters is, is the term I think he used. We have Dr. Najem's testimony from the plaintiff's, Dr. Najem is plaintiff's own expert who is going to testify that hydrazine degrades over time which then provides the jury with an explanation as to why there wouldn't be hydrazine in retail bottles because they go from the manufacturer to a distributor who keeps it in a warehouse for however long and then that distributor takes it to and delivers it to various retailers and then it sits on their shelf versus a home delivery where it's going straight from real water on their trucks throughout Clark County. There isn't enough time in those situations for degradation, especially if you take into the fact that there's evidence of not only um, uh, the concentrate uh, unintentionally or inadvertently producing the hydrazine, but that on the five gallon jug line that there were some issues with a pump that wasn't working and not allowing the concentrate to be dispersed evenly throughout the large tanks, which would result in a, a more of a concentrated concentrate in certain five gallon jugs than perhaps others. But that didn't apply to, uh, uh, that didn't apply to the retail bottles. Those were on, always on a separate line. I think I... No, I appreciate it. I just wanted to give you a chance if you wanted it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Okay. Before I go to Mr. Pepperman, Ms. Real Water, just want to make sure, do you have any view in here? Nothing to add. No. Okay. Mr. Pepperman, on behalf of plaintiffs, focusing purely on the summary judgment. Okay. The number two problems. First, are they legally bound? Second, I, I, was, I was starting with that, Your Honor, because again, you saw this clearly, nailed it right on the head. This, the, the, this idea about the stip and whether they're, they're not technically legally stipulating because we stipulate, but the effect of the stip is it's evidence on summary judgment. It's, it's in line with all the other evidence. And Your Honor nailed it directly. What's the summary judgment standard? We as the moving party bear the burden of production to show evidence that would be sufficient to prove our claims. 
We did that. The concentrate testing, the same concentrate used to make all real water, five gallon jugs, always made the same way with the same titanium tubes, with the expert testimony explaining how the hydrazine was being produced in the concentrate. Same concentrate maker, same room, same procedure at this time with the retail five gallons. We produced the expert testimony, exp causation testimony, saying the five ga the hydrazine in the five gallon, uh, in the retail bottle, was a substantial factor to a reasonable degree of medical probability. We established our burden, which now shifts to terrible herbs as the non-moving party who has to do more than offer speculation, conjecture, and uh, potential metaphysical doubt about the evidence. That is Wood v. Safeway, very clear. Uh, they cannot do that. They do not cite any evidence that suggests that the concentrate testing by the FDA was wrong, that there wasn't hydrazine in it, that there was some different process, that the hydrazine was getting introduced on the se some separate line. They have no theory, they have no expert to support any of that. They have no medical causation expert. They, I just heard a bunch of speculation about the time difference between uh, the, the production and the distribution of the five gallon versus the retail bottles. There is no evidence of that, Your Honor. I'll say stop for a quick second. They cited two of your experts as part of <coughs> who they say are going to testify, you know, two facts. One, that Dr. Najem is going to go through the degradation, right? So do you want to address that? And then let's address your other expert sure. afterwards with regards to... Sure, Your Honor. Uh, th those are both misleading. First of all, they're citing our experts to rebut summary judgment. I mean, that, they can. They can. Well, I, I mean, I think that should tell you something that, one, they don't have their own experts on any of this. So what they're left to do is rely on plaintiff's experts, which maybe they can do, but they're doing it by misstating uh, our experts' uh, opinions, which is, yes, hydrazine slowly degrades over time. There is none of our experts say that the time from the concentrate uh, process, from the time that this water is manufactured to consumed, it has any chance of affecting the um, toxicity of the levels of hydrazine that were found in that concentrate at, 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 the, at the time this water was consumed. In fact, the, our experts, th those opinions demonstrate that the hydrazine that was tested in the FDA was actually much higher when it was first manufactured because in this instance the evidence is that that concentrate was made uh, several months more than a year before it was uh, or more than two years before it was actually tested <clears throat> so the, if anything that evidence just demonstrates that there was likely more hydrazine in the water at the time of consumption than what our experts assumed was in there for the purposes of their analysis and opinions. So <clears throat> to cite our experts it, as some sort of support from, for their position is incorrect, it's misleading, and it's not even specifically fleshed out in the opposition because it, it's, it offers no support. That's just something that was raised for the first time uh, in oral argument. Uh, remember, Your Honor, they, they had a motion to exclude that testimony, and then suddenly they, they changed uh, their position on that. Um, with Dr. Hudson, we, we've gone over this a million times. Dr. Hudson is not the hydrazine expert. He looked at the hydrazine in the water that was consumed by Miles Hunwartson. He looked at that exposure based on the amounts that were uh, tested and known and could reasonably be expected to be in the uh, uh, bottles as determined by other experts and said, yeah, based on a differential diagnosis, considering their exposure to hydrazine as part of any other plausible causes and exposures, it's my opinion to a reasonable degree of medical probability that exposure to real water in, in both the five gallon and the retail bottles were substantial factors in causing his liver injuries. That is competent medical evidence, and it is incumbent upon them 
to have their own expert to rebut that or to give an alternative causation theory to, to challenge it. They have nothing. They have no evidence that, to rebut summary judgment under the clear summary judgment standard. They're just giving you speculation, conjecture, uh, and arguments trying to raise some metaphysical doubt about the evidence that plaintiffs have produced. But as Wood v. Safeway clearly holds, that is insufficient to defeat summary judgment. Your summary judgment is to liability and causation with regards to Hans Wurtzen, is that correct, not as to damages? Damages to be determined at uh, trial, yes, Your Honor. I'm just trying to get the clarity. Is it liability and causation? Yes, Your Honor. So you're asserting that you want the court to determine it was defective and unreasonably dangerous and caused Mr. Hans Wurtzen's injuries. Please give me, in your words, the scope of what you're actually asking the court to rule on, because I want to make sure, as you all know, it's been a changing. I'll use the word landscape again today. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I, under plaintiff Miles' strict liability claim against terrible herps, we ask for summary judgment in favor of Miles that the uh, retail real water that he purchased from terrible herps in 2019 was defective and unreasonably dangerous and a substantial factor in causing his liver injury in September 2019 with damages to be determined at the time of trial, which is exactly the same thing that Real Water uh, admitted to based on the, the same evidence, Your Honor. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Court's gonna have to grant summary judgment. And here's the reasoning why. <clears throat> I've looked at it from two different ways. First, I look at it. Okay, so first prong is, is terrible herbs legally bound by the stipulation? Technically, no, they are not legally bound to a stipulation that they did not enter into. However, are they, so then the court looks at this as a standard motion for summary judgment. Has plaintiff met their initial burden under Rule 56? The answer is yes. As Defendant Terrible Herbs met their burden under 56. The answer is no. Um, what Terrible Herbs has provided concepts and argument, but they have not, going straight to the language of 56, um, Been their burden, right? So, a party asserting that a fact cannot be or is generally disputed must support the assertion by citing to particular parts of materials, and this is 56C1 sub A, particular parts of materials in the record, including depositions, documents, electronically stored information, affidavits, or declarations, stipulations, friend, including those made for purposes of the motion only, admissions, interrogatory answers, or other materials, or B, showing that the material side do not establish. The absence or presence of a genuine issue of material factor that the adverse party cannot produce admissible evidence to support the fact. Well, the rule itself does say the court can take into stipulation, take into account stipulations or factual aspects even made for purposes of the motion only or a general stipulation, right? So, plaintiff has met its burden. Plaintiff has met its burden because what the court has is I have it undisputed that the concentrate that would have eventually gotten to terrible herbs was, quote the language of the stipulation, okay? What they've stated. So therefore, if that actual concentrate that eventually got to terrible herbs, terrible herbs would have then had to, by some aspect of appropriate evidence under Rule 56, say, and present evidence that somehow it was not effective, unreasonably dangerous. The first prong is I'm going for liability, then I'll go to causation. Um, now, terrible herbs to give an opportunity to set forth what their quote evidence was in response. When looking at their references to the two experts, the court does not find that it meets the standard of 56 because it really doesn't 
say what is really being asserted to say in that basis. Then I look at the other exhibits. The absence of two bottles having the traceable amounts at a particular time doesn't get you there, i.e. the urofins. The other examples provided by Terrell Herf, some of which was argument, some of which relates to other documentation, still does not meet the standard under 56. So, with regards to the liability portion of a product's liability claim, then I have to grant summary judgment. So now we have to go to the causation factor. Was it a substantial factor? And now I have to look at there's alternative causation. Well, as you all know by the court's rulings, um, including unopposed motions, folks, okay, there is nothing that is being presented as an alternative theory of causation. Morriscato, Williams, right? So if there's not anything, there's no expert that's presented to this court that's going to provide an alternative theory of medical causation. So realistically, what the court has is the court only has plaintiffs' causation analysis via their experts. Even looking at what's being asserted is going to go on cross-examination. It does not provide the standards necessary under the applicable case law to provide the alternative. So the court has to find it is a substantial factor in causing mild sores and bless you. Injuries. Um, one more second. And we'll have, anyway. um, so, therefore, the court also has to grant the motion for summary. And I'm going I'm to call it motion for partial summary judgment because realistically it's going to couple the problems, not the entire. Um, so the court finds adopting the arguments and case law cited in the briefs by well, all parties, but the analysis set forth by plaintiffs. And yes, the court fully took into account the supplemental briefs and everything presented, taking into account both aspects of oral argument has been presented and the additional questions the court received the responses to to get the clarification of what actually was being presented both for purposes of the motion for summary judgment and in response thereto. It is so ordered plaintiff's motion for summary judgment number one with regards to real water is moot and the court need not rule based on the agreement of the parties between real water and plaintiffs. With regards to terrible herbs, the court is going to grant the motion for summary judgment with regards to the liability and causation as further articulated a moment ago. So it is so ordered. That means plaintiffs, you're preparing that motion for the findings, fact, conclusions of the law, for the circling to everyone else and providing it back to the court. And for all of these, remember it's EDCR 7.21. You all might want to, I mean, figure out your timing, but remember when your trial's starting and what you need to get done. And I appreciate with transcripts and things, but remember, I'm going. To, if anybody's not gotten this court orders right with notice of entry of orders there on, before you call your first witness, do realize that this court's going to have to readdress the concept of Division of Family Services in Must versus Clark County, right? So if you all are going to tell me it's the holidays, you need. I'm going to be perfectly empathetic to that, right? But just make sure that you're telling this court also that no one's going to raise an issue under Rust versus Clark County or Division of Family Services that an oral pronouncement from the bench is not effective because you can appreciate if somebody's going to raise that. We're going to make sure you have your any right your written orders and your NEOs because we want to ensure that everyone gets their full and fair trial. You don't for the purposes of right in the middle of trial and somebody says, guess what, Your Honor, we can't go forward because we don't have X, Y, or Z. I'm not in any way saying that anyone would ever do that been there, done that. Um, but so that's the advance in case the question was coming my way about timing of orders. This court will accommodate timing of orders as long as it doesn't have the unintended consequence that somebody's going to be arguing the fact that a written order memorialized with notice of entry of order somehow has an impact with regard to the trial. Okay. Does that work for everybody? Yes, Your Honor. I think we have a one day turnaround on the daily now. I, so I, I um, Maybe it's two days, but I don't know how Christmas impacts that. But uh, we'll, we'll try to get it to you as soon as we can after. Right, but you understand the court's fully empathetic and, and cognizant. You know what I mean? Do what you need to do. Just make sure you're not having an unintended consequence. Russ was actually my case, Your Honor. I'm familiar. Yes, I'm just saying. But, but you understand. I'm right. Bill Levine for Real Water. Thank you very much, Your Honor. And um, one of, that was a question that we had because the uh, court's um, request for the pretrial memorandum was. Uh, an indication on pretrial orders. And so um, we had read that as the court, perhaps uh, the parties can reach some agreement as to what the orders were, but they wouldn't be formal orders. In other words, the pretrial memorandum would say, am I on number one granted order pending or some innocuous language like that. 
court, like I said, the court. You'd ask, kind of, let's, uh, I'll expand a little bit then to your question. To your question is, as long as the parties are comfortable with what the pretrial memo says and does not set forth it because there's not an analysis in the pretrial memo, that somehow that means the court did not go through its extensive analysis that has gone through on each and every one of these motions, then of course I'm going to have to say, put it all in there. Right. Right? If you all are agreeing and you put in the document, you know, by the party's agreement, we're just doing this short summary, orders are pending, and no one's going to raise an issue, right? Then the court's going to be fine with it because. But Thank you, Your Honor. Is that okay? Remember also, though, for you all's sake, right, is if somebody thinks you're going to be arguing one of these rulings very early on in the case, it usually is more helpful to have said written order because people like to refer to it, right? Yes, Versus, sir. you know. In essence, so the court's flexible as long as it's not going to have the unintended consequence that someone's going to raise an issue that the court's flexibility is going to come back to say that somehow things were not done as they needed to be done. Does anyone have any questions? Or does that seem to make sense? I assume it's, you all get along, right? That's on this kind of issues, right? We understand that. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Does anyone need me to specifically enforce the EDCR 7.21? right here during the holiday period, right before trial, or you all are going to make sure you get things done because you want it in your own best interests? Yeah, we are on top of it. Okay, so you don't, okay, you don't need anything further in this, is that right? No, Your Honor, we appreciate the flexibility. Yeah, yeah the court's fine with flexibility, it's just, like I said, I've been stung on that one in the past, so now I have to give my caveats, so. Um, okay, so the court's now taking care of the motion for summary judgment. We are now going on, so that was document 533. We show next to the, I do know, I need to do a terrible herbs, document 473, um, the joint of real water, oh no, sorry, joint, real water's opposition there too, plaintiff's opposition there too, the waters joiners to plaintiff's opposition there too, and Carol Herp's reply there too. And let me get you some document numbers. So 473 was the initial motion. Real waters opposition was 810. Plaintiff's opposition was date document 859, 851. Excuse me. Real waters joiner to plaintiff's opposition 893, and terrible Herp's reply there too 956. In light of the court's rulings with regards to document 533, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment. What still do the parties wish to argue with regards to the motion to eliminate? Because the court made the first ruling not legally bound, but then the ruling with the impact on summary judgment. Counsel for yeah, Terrell, I mean, your motion. Go ahead. Essentially rendered moot. There is not going to be really a trial on liability and causation. Our, our motion to eliminate was to exclude the admissions from the first from real law. So. The, reason, sure, the reason why the court was asking the question is because I didn't know whether or not there was still an issue with regards to sometimes, and once again, you have to realize, I was not listening to Gallagher because I have this case, right? I, not only was I busy with my own cases, but you know what I mean? So if somebody is intending, quote, to read a stipulation, I didn't know if Gerald Herbst was going to have an issue with that one way or another, or whether or not you even had a chance to potentially digest said comment or said position. So that's why I wasn't sure if there was something left for purposes of this motion, because technically your motion is to preclude the reference, not the legal impact of it, but the reference to it. So go ahead if you want to. Right. And if you and think I'm it's completely really, moot, then fine. I, I, you know, frankly, I haven't had a chance to digest it. I, I believe it's moot, um, but, to the, but, but let me, actually it may not be, um, because this dealt with the references to the Gallagher trial and, they, and the admissions made in Gallagher. At that point, when we initially filed this motion, um, you had a Gallagher step, but you didn't have a step here. Exactly. And we also had the motion for uh, summary judgment on issue preclusion. So our thought was they were obviously going to try to use a Gallagher step here. So Would you like me to reach out to plaintiff's counsel and ask them if they're in any way planning on intending to reference to Gallagher? And then you know, to ask Real Water whether they're intending to reference Gallagher? And then you can do whatever you want to do. Would that be more helpful? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, Council for plaintiffs. Yeah, Judge, I thought we've said a couple times we're not going to reference the stipulation of verdict in Gallagher, so I think it is a moot point. Okay. Council for real water. Yes, we we had heard those representations or relied upon them that no one is going to reference the Gallagher verdict trial that sort of thing in this case, including real water. Including real water, we definitely would not be bringing it up. You know, just going to have to ask the question to make Absolutely, sure. Absolutely, Your Honor. Okay, so in light of the representations of counsel for counsel. For plaintiffs and the representation of counsel for real water. Is there something left you wish the court to address on this motion? I don't believe so. It sounds like we're not going to be talking about admissions or stipulations or anything to do with Gallagher. Okay. So I, I think with that agreement, it would be moved. Okay. Court's going to say it needs not rule on document 473, motion eliminate, because it's deemed moot based on this representations of all parties in open court. Okay. So. Um, Your Honor, go ahead, I'm, Council. I'm not sure what's left, but um, if I can have a brief break. Oh yeah, sure, of course. And then everyone can check theirs to see what you show is left. Okay, feel free. To come back in ten minutes. Come in ten minutes to twelve, and we'll see. Go ahead, please. Do you think something's left? Lost I still show that there's part of one still left since oh, yeah. nineteen. The future, future lost earnings. I still show. Yeah. I still show part of future lost earnings. Is the if that was the question? Yeah. But I was going to confirm it with the parties. So that's the last thing I see. I think that's right. Okay, stand up, stretch your legs, whatever you need. Okay. We are back on the record. Same case, same parties. So, counsel, we show next is Real Waters Motion Limited Number 11 to preclude plaintiff Hunsworth's and future lost earnings as speculative undisclosed opinion. If you recall, when you already started, all parties started to argue this one. There were some questions with regards to the chronology. This is your life care planners and their difference in positions. And so we continued it to today. So let's walk through what you need addressed. I'm going to just go the same order. So, counsel for Real Water, to your motion. So go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, Joel Adieu on behalf of Real Water, just the very last piece of the chronology was that our first notice of Dr. Hudson's opinion, uh, which had changed, was a supplement from UHAS, the, uh, the life care planner. That's not appropriate, and that's why we had sought to exclude it. It's because if Dr. Hudson wants to change his opinion, he's got to do a timely supplement, and he can't just do a show up at a deposition and offer a new opinion. So that's how time frame wise it came to be. Uh, Mr. Uhas and Dr. Hudson did not coordinate. Not That's not up to us. It's not something we could control. And so for that reason, uh, we think this uh, claim for future damages uh, should not be admitted. In addition, we received notice that there's some kind of supplement that's coming. We have asked for a copy of that supplement, haven't seen it. Uh, we will be issuing an objection tomorrow pursuant to this court's rules on pretrial objections, but um, that appears to be involved in this issue is just based on the description of the document. We don't know what it is that they're trying to supplement at this point. Okay. Um, Terrell Herbst, you had a joinder there too. Document 743, do you wish to be heard? Nothing to add, Your Honor. Thank you so much. Council for Plaintiffs, focusing on what's the court today. Yes, Your Honor, I, I, based on your comments um, at, at last time when the, we discussed this motion, I, I went back and looked through the chronology and just to bring it to the court's attention. Um, Mr. Uhas, the life care planner and vocational expert, disclosed his expert report on September 22nd. He uh, produced his uh, addendum, which disclosed the vocational damages on September 29th. Uh, on October 5th, our economist um, supplemented his report with the present value of the damages disclosed on the 29th. On October 6th, we supplemented our computation of damages pursuant to 16.1 to set forth the vocational damages that we are claiming 
the total amount and specifically said, quote, these figures are based on the previously produced expert reports of Mr. Steve Uhas, uh and expert reports of Mark Rich, who's the economist, um, on October 16th, uh, Real Waters Medical expert disclosed his supplemental report <clears throat> on October 20th. Real Water disclosed the report of Matthew Sims, who's their vocational ec economist, uh, on these exact issues. Um, Dr. Hudson was deposed on October 27th, 2023. Uh, Dr. Hudson previously disclosed all his opinions on the future of care. The only questionable issue was uh, where how that might affect his uh, Miles' ability to work. Uh, we did not view that as a new opinion or separate opinion by Dr. Hudson, but rather the opinion of Dr. Or Mr. Uhas, who just consulted with Dr. Hudson. Either way, uh, Dr. Hudson was asked about this in his deposition. Uh, he was questioned about it. It was well disclosed long before. They were had the full opportunity to disclose him. Uh, they deposed Mr. Uhas on November 1st, 2023. He was uh, fully asked about th this issue and these damages. Uh, I deposed the vocational economist, Mr. Sims, on November 3rd, 2023. Uh, he did not dispute any, any the issue of how long he Miles would be able to work. Rather, his opinion on this is he didn't dispute that he wouldn't be able to continue as an iron worker. He just said when he can't continue as an iron worker, he can transition to a job making just as much money, so there are no damages. I just deposed their life care planner on November 6, 2023. And finally, Dr. Alcina, Real Waters Medical expert, was deposed on November 14th, 2023. Uh, Dr. Alcina was um, asked about this. He did not say any, anything. He did not dispute that Miles would not be able to continue as an iron worker. In fact, he only confirmed the damages because in uh, Dr. Alcina's opinion, um, Miles isn't going to be, uh, his, his life expectancy isn't expected to exceed the median 15 years, uh, which puts it right at the same time of, of the time that we're saying that Miles needs to transition into a different job. So even by a Real Water's own expert, these damages are available because Miles will not be able to work if he's not alive. Um, and if, if he is, they have in, if he is alive, then they have a vocational expert to say, to rebut these damages. So your honor, we would uh, refer the court to, to rule 37, which any type of exclusion uh, requires um, the failure to disclose to be um, the failure to disclose results in the inability to introduce the evidence unless the failure to disclose is substantially justified or harmless. Uh, Your Honor, we don't view this as a failure to disclose for all the reasons I previously stated, but even if we did make some technical mistake in the disclosures, that mistake was harmless because they have their own experts on this. They questioned all our experts. They know these issues. They have experts on these issues. And this is, we're talking about, you know, potentially in excess of $2 million in, in damages. And to take those damages away from uh, M Miles based on the arguments, uh, uh, the technical arguments where there's been no show of harm, uh, we think would be unfair. And we'd ask you to deny the motion. Here's what the court has a question. Based on your statement a few moments ago that he can't work if he's not alive, right? And so, in essence, that normally would go to a zero, right? Because if we're talking about a potential year, if he's not going to live the 15 years, then the issue would not come about until after he is potentially deceased. So I heard that, and then I heard you say it's $2 million. So can you walk through how what, what you mean by those two concepts? So, so where's your two million coming from if it's a net gain zero because he's not going to be alive at the date that it's going to be an issue in 15 years? Well, Hopefully he is. I'm not, but that's I'm just listening to your arguments. Go ahead, please. So, Your Honor, the the loss of earning capacity 
comes from the fact that Miles is an iron worker. Uh, he, it's a very strenuous job that given his physical limitations that are expected in the future, he's not gonna be able to safely perform. So he's gonna have to transition into a lighter duty job. Given, given his skill set, the jobs that are gonna be available for him aren't gonna be jobs that pay as much as he earns now as an iron worker. And so when he transitions into that job, he's gonna earn substantially less than what he's making now. And though those numbers- At what point in time? This is why, I, this is what I need to point in time. You're saying, you're saying it's gonna happen in a year? It's gonna happen at the 15 year mark? Because originally I was hearing you say it's gonna happen at the 15 year mark, so it's a net sum zero. Now I'm hearing you say it's gonna be sometime way sooner than then, so. Our vocational expert says, consulted with Dr. Hudson and based on his experience and his consultation with Dr. Hudson, says Miles will have to transition into a different job around age 40, which is approximately 10 years or so after his liver transplant. And so at that time, given the likely jobs that are gonna be available to him for the rest of his otherwise, what would have been his expected work life expectancy, those damages add up over that time span to the approximately $2 million in loss of earning capacity damages. Uh, our opinion, our experts opine that if, if he hadn't had this injury, he would have been able to work in his job until a normal retirement age, he would have made this much money. But because of this injury, he's not gonna be able to work in his current <laughs> job. He's gonna have to transition to a different job and the money he's gonna miss out on because of that is the damages. But then, when it, when's the transition? That's, I, I keep on, sorry, getting a point of clarification. When is the asserted transition to the lower paying job from your expert's position? From our expert's position, they're uh, accounting for a, a drop in pay at around age 40, which is uh, 10, um, seven years from now, approximately. So in seven so years. Eight years, he's gonna, it's a, 2000, it's a $2 million distinction in eight years? No, Your Honor, in, in eight years when he has to transition to a new job, he's making like a hundred and something thousand dollars a year now in his current job. Because of his training, education, ex skills, when he has to, when he can't be an iron worker anymore and has to transfer to a, a different lighter duty job, the jobs that are available to someone with his skill set, they don't pay nearly as much as $100,000 a year. So when you add up that loss and let's say he's gonna make 40,000, I, I don't have the exact numbers. So 60,000 a year he's losing for a period of 25 years over time, that adds up to the $2 million. Right. But then I heard you say his life expectancy is not gonna be more than 15 years, which is why this court was asking the question. You have a 25 year calculation for damages, but only a 15 year calculation for life expectancy, right? With a net difference of 10 years. That's what I was trying to get a clarity of okay. where you're getting. I, I'm sorry, I understand. <laughs> Real Waters medical expert says he's not gonna be alive in 15 years from the date of his liver transplant. So if, if that were the case, and those you know, seven damages, or, seven or eight years. Okay. yeah, those damages would be even more because it's still a loss of earning capacity because of his injury. Okay. He's just not working for a different reason or not earning money because he's not alive. So that's the only point is to say they're not saying he's going to continue working around the same time we're saying he's not going to be able to be an iron worker. It's just a different reason. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Counts for real water. You get last word and your framing of this is a bit different. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Joel Adieu on behalf of the Real Water. Uh, as the court just heard, it's a moving target. Rebuttal expert disclosures were due on September 1st. Um, Bush's report was not until October. That's after the rebuttal deadline. There was accommodations made, letters exchanged as to extending that deadline for specific experts. I do not remember an accommodation being given for Mr. Rich to provide a late opinion. Um, the problem that we have with Mr. Juhas is Mr. Juhas uh, claimed after the fact that he had this secret consulting consult, consultation with Dr. Hudson to justify his opinions. It's not in his report. It should have been in his report that, you know, I, Mr. Juhas spoke to Dr. Hudson. Dr. Hudson opined that because Mr. Um, Hunwardson is a steel worker and he works outside, uh, he's going to run a risk of cancer. Therefore, he can't take jobs outside. 
That impacts his future loss of earnings capacity because when he's no longer able to work as an iron worker, he can't be a construction foreman, which is one of the things that our economist opined and said, look, you may not be able to do the physically demanding work of an iron worker. However, you could be a foreman, you could be a supervisor. There's a lot of jobs that you could do. In response to that, plaintiff's economist said, oh no, he can't do those things. And I've got this secret opinion from Dr. Hudson. Then we take Dr. Hudson's deposition and it's like, oh, it's not in my report, but yeah, he can't do these things. And that's where we brought this motion, Your Honor. Now they're talking about some type of $100,000 a year thing. We've not seen any documents on that. So, you know, again, I'm sorry that we have to bring a follow the law motion on limine, but that's really what we're doing. If it's not in the report, if there's not an agreement amongst counsel that the report can come after, which happened in this case for some experts, but not others, then it shouldn't come in. And the court should uh, strictly construe rule 16.1 to require whatever you disclosed, that's the evidence. You can't go beyond it and now come up with these new ideas. And how about the harmless concept? I'm sorry, Your Honor. The harmless concept. So harm, it is absolutely not harmless. This is all. I'm just giving you an crap. opportunity to answer. I'm sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> it's like the ice cream truck. I hear the truck, I go running. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No worries. If you don't want to address it, you know what I mean? I, no, I do. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Um, I took the bait. Um, yeah, it's very prejudicial. So basically, what happened here is our expert put forth a report. The plaintiffs looked at our expert's report, looked at ways to attack his opinion, in particular, the life care planner, and said, look, this life care planner says Mr. Hunwardson can be a supervisor. Let's go to our doctor and see why he can't be a supervisor. You know, if that's going to be a rebuttal, okay, disclose it. Don't make us find that out in a deposition. And now our life care planner can't respond to that. And that's the issue. That's the prejudice. And you stated that it did not come in, it did or did not come in a supplemental report post deposition? No. Still not Hudson, even though his depot was 1027. Yeah, it came out in Hudson's depot where this new information arose and that UHAS had consulted with Hudson. I mean, typically what you do is your experts talk to each other and they put a little memo in their file and say, I, Stephen UHAS, spoke to Dr. Hudson on this date. We talked about plaintiff Miles Hunwardson. Dr. Hudson advised me that because he's got uh, an impaired immune system. He can't run the risk of getting skin cancer. Therefore, he can't work in supervisory jobs. That's how that would have been the proper way to do it. Okay. Here's the court's ruling. The court's going to grant it. Your Honor, I, uh, I, I must. Counsel, counsel. I apologize, but what Mr. Odu just said, the entire reputation is inaccurate. No. I have to take officers of the court, it was officers of the court, right? So I'm not in, in suggesting that Mr. Odu intentionally misstated anything at all. I, I would never suggest that I use a, an impeccable post uh, text counsel. Um, but he was mistaken, Your Honor. The, the timeline that he gave you was not accurate. And for a motion of this significance, I'd ask that I be, be heard on that before we move And I don't have objections, Mr. President. There's no objection? Then go ahead, me. please. If he says, if I, if I, you got like two or three minutes because council's afternoon, so we're if I likely to take on the lunch. Timeline, I'm right. sure he'll correct me. Your Honor, if, if the court's inclined, I'm happy to take this up on a, another day. But um, very simply, Doctor um, Mr. Uhas disclosed in his rebuttal report on September 29th that he consulted with Doctor Hudson, and that was part of the basis for his opinion in determining what year that Miles wasn't going to be able to continue as an iron worker. Uh, it was not Dr. Hudson's opinion. We did not believe there was any reason for Dr. Hudson to supplement his uh, report. If we were technically wrong about that, it was a harmless error because they knew that- Council, that Council Mr. not going back to arguments, right? You said that Mr. Odu made incorrect factual statement as to chronology. I gave you that opportunity, but I can't give you an opportunity to reopen up argument again because counsel, right? He, he said that Mr. Uhas didn't disclose the opinion. It first came out in Dr. Hudson's deposition, and then we went back to bring some issue with this, whether he could be a supervisor. That is what's inaccurate. It was disclosed in the Uhas report on September 29th. 
It was questioned, Dr. Hudson was questioned about it in his deposition because it had been disclosed. It was, the issue was the subject of their rebuttal vocational expert's opinion. This issue of whether he could be a supervisor or not, that has nothing to do with the medical opinion of Dr. Hudson or the limitations. It has solely to do with the transferable skills analysis, which was an uh, issue teed up by the vocational reports that were timely disclosed. So, Your Honor, that is why it's inaccurate. So, point me to the exhibit in which it was attached, that you assert it's in the reports. So the court could take a quick look at that, please. Told inside of multiple. Are you referencing Hudson or Uhas for your purposes? It was in uh, Mr. Uhas's uh, rebuttal report. I'm not sure if that was attached as an exhibit or not. That's why. I looked at your opposition, right? Document 849 filed on 1129. I did not see. You houses got a report attached them too, so I was asking. And that that may have been my confusion and why it, the confusion between us and the inaccurate time frame. I didn't realize they were suggesting that this wasn't disclosed in Mr. Uhas's addendum report. So how can this court take it into account if it's not that's why I was giving you a chance, right? To Say where it is, because if it's not actually in the briefs before the court, how can I just take the arguments? Right? I actually have to have it before me as the information to be presented for the court. I, I would agree with that, Your Honor, but it's their motion. They're the ones asking you to exclude damages on this basis. Um, but if you feel that it was actually addressed in something, right, then you would have to provide that. I, I'm happy to, to do that, Your Honor. I, I wasn't aware that this was the argument they were making. Uh, I didn't get that from the briefing, and it's not accurate. If, if I understood that they were making this argument, I would have addressed that and would have shown, Your Honor, this disclosure. We do cite Dr. Hudson's um, deposition where he's asked about it. And but it's, remember, you can't just bring up new things at a time of a deposition, right? It has to be actually be in the expert report. Otherwise, because a lot of times people don't take deps. Obviously, in a case like this, I would say, yeah. people don't take depositions, so it has to be right. The rule requires expert reports, right, to disclose all the opinions, to give people an opportunity to prepare for said depositions. And the idea is you can't expand your, can't expand and provide new opinions at the time of deposition, up to court order and a couple other exceptions, right? So I'm just asking, I didn't see it before this court. If you think it was, that's why I was giving you a chance. But you have a 36-page opposition. I didn't see it attached. I. Uh Correct, Your Honor. I didn't understand. They were saying they were trying to say that this wasn't mentioned. Doctor or Mr. Uhas's consultation and basis for his opinion, as based on his discussion with uh, Dr. Hudson, which <laughs> counsel admits is ordinary course. Experts talk. Counsel, I'm not. You can appreciate it's their motion. I've got to give them last word. In fairness, it's now twelve ten. This court really was a simple question. I was trying to give you an opportunity if you thought it was actually presented to the court in the pleadings to let the court know where it was for purposes of this motion, not to re-argue the issues because that's not fair to any of the other parties who maybe would have liked to re-argue a lot of the different motions we've gone over in the last several days, right? It, so. It's not my intent to re-argue, Your Honor. I would just ask, given this confusion, I would re respectfully request the ability to submit it to the court so the court can make its decision based on the accurate set of facts um, and not the un unsupported arguments of counsel without them. Also, for what I mean, in fairness, this is even a continued hearing today, right? So people even had extra time if there's an oops. Um, and there's been a lot of hearings and things that people would like to supplement, at least supplement when there was. Request for it. Let me hear Real Water's position because if Real Water wants me to make a ruling today, I'm going to have to make a real ruling today based on what is actually presented Your Honor, to this court. 
Joel Ledoux for Real Water. We're meeting with Mr. Pepperman tomorrow um, to talk about other issues. I'm happy to address this issue with him and revisit with the court. I'm looking at Mr. Uhas's report and, that he referenced from September. And again, he says he has a consultation, but it's not the detail. The detail, the devil is in the details. In this case, the detail was where did Dr. Hudson put in writing that Miles Hunwardson can't do these other jobs because he can't be outside, he can't run the risk of skin cancer. Those those were the opinions that we were objecting to, and those, those opinions in our view came about to attack our expert saying he's retrainable. Uh, if, I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna, if I just am not seeing it. And so I'm willing so counsel, to counsel, sit down and meet with them. Okay. Counsel, here's the issue. If somebody's requesting it's their own motion, right? It takes the impact of the time period on your other matters, right? Got to get through what we need to get through, or I'll be, because I got a trial starting on the 28th. If not, I'll be seeing you all on the 29th in the afternoon, because I've got the other trial the 28th in the morning of the 29th. So if you're asking the court to continue it, you're the movement. I'm putting it over to the, we're going to be here on the 27th. You only got part of the day on the 27th, because you know I've got a lot of other matters, right? Yeah, whatever the court's going to be answering. I'm just saying, you're starting in the afternoon on the 27th, so... You all have to get through all your depot designations and everything that you need to get taken care of. If not, I'm telling you, the next date is the afternoon. I've got a trial that's continuing on the 28th. Um, so, what time are? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. What time are we here on the 27th? One o'clock. Thank you. Anna. Okay, uh, you all know how much there is to get done in that afternoon, right? And so I leave it to you all, because it's your motion. If you're requesting it to be. Moved and it's not a prejudice to anybody, and it's not going to. Yeah, I'm fine with moving it to the 27th or the 29th at the court's convenience. Good luck me trying to get staff on the 29th, but okay, <laughs> that's a different issue. It's people have made plans based on not having any, you know what I mean? I've got usually staff leaves, it's the same thing on the 29th, right? Staff usually leaves noon or 1 p.m. Friday before a holiday. If you all are going to require this court to. Hold a hearing, you know, when they're supposed to be gone, I'm going to have to hear that in open court, is that you all are requesting and why it needs to be done, because in fairness to the team, that's the way we do it with all matters for holidays, right? Because they have to find out if it's required, right? Versus getting to go home when court administration lets people go home. I'm not making a position right now on the 29th. Maybe we can get everything done on the 27th. We've been very efficient in general. Okay, We've so. We've been very efficient. We really yes. appreciate that. So, um, Okay. At the request of the movement and not hearing any, did I request also by Council for Plaintiffs? Yes, Your Honor. Council for Terrible Herbs, do you have any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Okay, requests, request, and no objection. We're moving that one to the 27th. Okay, that means you thought you were going to be at lunch too. Okay, so the one thing I just need to address real briefly because my team needs to go to the exchange, I believe. And I can, call, I can address this after lunch or I can take three minutes now. My question is going to be, I do not have motions by terrible perps in any proper format to hear, okay? However, is this court aware of something being filed? Because obviously I'm looking at this case nonstop, right? So is anybody going to file those that they're going to want the court to hear them in a proper manner that I should be addressing? Or I think I those are largely moot, Your Honor. Um, so we would likely, I, I need to go back and reconsider, but we'll probably need to withdraw those. Okay, so then in light of what your statements are at this juncture, I'm going to say, since I don't have anything properly, the court's not going to, I'm giving you the same consideration that I gave with regards to when plaintiffs, you know, had their supplement to see if you all were going to be working on some kind of briefing schedule. I have you all here in open court. I could have done that. But in light of your statements, I'll just wait and see what comes to me. Okay? Okay. Does that work? Yeah, that works. Does that work for everybody yeah. else? Yes, sir. Okay, have a great lunch. I do not see anything else on for today. Is that correct? I don't think there's anything else left, Your Honor. I don't see anything else. Okay, I'm just making last round, making sure nobody thinks that there's something else the court's not yet ruled on that I actually have. I mean, Mr. So Odu, anything Nothing you else, see? Your Honor. Okay, then we're going off the record. Have a great rest of your day till we see you on the 27th. That means have a happy holidays in the intervening time with whatever you celebrate, or hopefully you've already had a happy holidays if you celebrate other things. Have a great day. Thank you, Your Honor.